Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter, but not the spirit of request. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story. Supervisor thought that I was doing a lot of work, and ordered me to do less work. I refused to help her and soon she left. The second story. Company wanted to save money, but ended up losing its employees and customers. The third story. Boss refused to help, so jerk boss is left alone with traffic whizzing past his head. On to the first story. You want me to stay in my lane? You got it, boss. Some time ago, I used to work in a medical specialty office. It was ID, or infectious disease, at a medical assistant. Sidebar. I used to work in the food industry and was always told that I would never contribute to society or do anything meaningful with my life. While I absolutely loved working as a chef and baker at the time, I wanted to do more with my life and prove to myself that I'm not as useless as people made me out to be. Not that I believe that for one second, but in my culture if you aren't a businessman or a doctor, you're lower than everyone else. It's pretty terrible but that's how the culture is. I now live in the US and it's been pretty good. Back to the story. I had graduated top 3 in my class and was certified through the AAMA, and scored in the 90th percentile, so I knew my stuff. But I've never worked a white collar job in my life, so I was afraid that I would seem out of place. I did my externship at this ID clinic in my town, and they loved my interpersonal skills. They loved my work and stated that I would be offered a job at the end of my externship. I was elated. I was so happy to have a job secured and have a foot in the door to the medical field. It turns out my blue collar experience helped me relate with a lot of our patients, and they appreciated my work more for it. As my time went on, my experience working in the medical field became less about the money and more about the people I can help with my direct patient care. They weren't just charts. MRNs, medical record number for those non-medical folk, and diagnoses. They were Jeff who ran the local farmer's market, or Meg who worked with the kids at the Y. I cared for my patients and our repeats would always look forward to coming back to see me and chat. I loved working with my patients. So at the end of my externship, I was extended an offer of employment for a decent amount of money. It was more than my other classmates were offered at their practices, but still not a whole lot, and I took it. I was to be the medical assistant in charge of direct patient care. This meant checking in, rooming, dealing with prescriptions, performing and searching for labs, packing wounds and doing dressing changes. Being officially a part of the office now, I was determined to work my A off and show myself and my colleagues that I could do it. I continued to do my work and care for patients. However, over time I would notice certain things that weren't in my job duties that I could do that would help care for the patients. Certain things like calling their doctors for updated orders or checking for records from local hospitals. Also helping patients find good home health or SNFs, skilled nursing facilities, generally the medical scheduler's job. This also included looking into insurance coverage, billing, and checking referral statuses, referral coordinators, among other things. Doing these tasks meant a bit more work on my end, but also meant the best care that I could offer to my patients. This went on for a year, and my patients were happy and willing to come to appointments. Apparently not a whole lot of people like to come to a building that has the words infectious diseases in big print on its side. Then one day out of the blue I'm called into my supervisor. Young naive me thought, oh great, they see how hard I'm working and I'm finally getting recognized. Maybe they'll promote me to lead. Nope. My boss Shelly told me that I'm working too hard and sticking my fingers into too many pots. I asked where this was coming from. She stated that I was staying more than 5 minutes late too many times, and it's because I'm doing too much work. She said we can't keep paying you all this overtime. I think I was maybe making 30 minutes OT at most. She said that's still too much. I'm doing too much work. I was baffled, absolutely stunned. I thought I was doing the practice a service, but she undermined the entirety of the last year's hard work I put it. I was frustrated and a bit upset, but tried my best to remain professional. So I asked her what she would like me to do, and the next words out of her mouth were ones she would come to regret. Well, I see you're doing a lot of tasks that are meant for other positions. Maybe you should stop doing those and just stay in your lane. She then proceeded to write me up for trying to abuse the time clock. Insert Jim Carrey, alrighty then, and cue malicious compliance. I asked her to send me a list of exactly what my job duties are, which she was happy to do. It listed most of what I was originally meant to do, except it didn't include dressing changes and packing wounds. I saw this and immediately knew this would be trouble, for my boss. You see, she was the only other medical assistant on our end of the office that was certified to deal with minor wound care and dressings. At that point, since I was the main contact for patients, that would fall onto her plate. So I told each of my patients that I won't be doing any of that extra work because it goes against the practice's wishes, and I was told not to. All of them understood, 
but it's tough to get patients to keep appointments when things are delayed. Not long after the order was issued, I got my first page for a wound pack. Excellent. One thing to note about my boss is that she absolutely abhors feet. And one thing to note about infectious disease clinics is that we dealt with a lot of diabetic foot infections. At least two or three a day. Doc wants to see how it's healing, so he removes the wrap and unpacks the foot. Spent a little extra time with the patient and now has to get to his next appointment. I'm paged by the doctor to pack the foot, wet to dry. No problem here, Doc. Let me get Shelly for you. He gives me kind of an odd look, but continues his next appointment. Shelly gloves up and as soon as she passes the threshold of the room and notices it's a diabetic food, is holding back her gags and immediately sweating. I pass by the room and she asks for my help. As calmly as I could, I turned and said, sorry boss, packing wounds isn't on my list. Can't do it. Just staying in my lane. By the way, the two o'clock in three is a through and through foot infection. Probably should get that packed soon too. I'm glad we were wearing masks because she couldn't see the massive SH eating grin on my face throughout that whole encounter. She tried to write me up about disobeying superiors, but I had spoken with my GM and she was behind me. Instead, she ended up getting written up for trying to put wound packs back on my list after she told me I did too much work. She ended up having to do part of the medical schedule's job, part of the referral coordinator's job, and part of the billing office's job, as she had let go one of our front desk staff because there was not enough work to go around. There was plenty of work, I was doing it. She didn't last long after that. The burnout got to her and she stepped down from her supervisor position four months after that. They ended up hiring another super and I left the practice shortly after I got the vid. They told me to come back into work after three days and still very sympathetic. So I told them I wouldn't endanger my patients like that and to shove it. Last I heard they have an entirely new front office staff and they're perpetually short-handed. Shoulda let me drive my own path instead of staying in your silly lanes. The second story is, company changes paid travel policy to save money. We follow it costing them more. So for my old job, I was a forklift mechanic. I started off in our shop. Bad driving record kept me from starting in a service van. I'd been looking to buy a house, and once my boss got wind of it, he said, hey, you should move out west so we have a van out there. We had several large customers two to three hours from our shop that were being serviced by techs that would drive out and back each day. So I obliged, bought a house right in the middle of them all, getting a company van, and saving them lots of money paying techs to drive each way, while also getting to move out of the city and live in the sticks. We had techs scattered throughout the several hundred square mile territory of our branch. The original travel policy was set up so we gave up half an hour to the first customer, and the last half hour of the day as well. Normally we'd all try to start and end close to our house so it wasn't a big deal, and occasionally take a longer trip if need be for the whole day. One of our biggest customers was an hour drive each way, so I'd spend 12 hours there, including unpaid lunch, travel to and from the customer. I'd get paid for 13 hours while being gone for 15.5 hours. Getting 12 hours of on-site work before the move, our company would pay someone 2.5 hours each way and put an extra 140 miles on their service van to do so. Having techs spread out was efficient. They would occasionally send someone out with a parts restock and to help knock out some work while they were here. And they'd drive straight out and work the whole day, then drive back home at night. Well, some bean counter decided they were paying too much money for commute time. They changed it to 45 minutes given up in the morning and zero pay in the afternoon. For most techs, it didn't change much, but for the handful of us that were the most remote, it meant we'd lose 5 to 10 hours of pay each week. It caused an outrage, but of course the company said too bad. So here's where we started complying. I had a customer that was 15 minutes away to the north. They had a lot of trucks that required monthly service for whatever dumb reason. They decided to pick that interval. Most of them were backup units that only moved if they were in the way, or when I serviced them. So I'd start my day there, do the 45 minute check on a truck that was in the same spot it was last time I checked it, then drove back past my house to the customer, on the clock, wasting a solid half hour of the day driving extra, and then repeat in the afternoon. We all did this and our efficiency dropped. Now instead of changing the rule to not suck, they started writing us up. Eventually we all started quitting. I pursued my side hobby and turned it into a business. Ended up renting a shop next to the biggest customer we had out here, and get to see two vans parked there almost every day, from the main branch. I laughed knowing how much they were wasting sending them both out almost daily. Several of my old customers would see me around town and say, man I wish you hadn't quit, we're switching companies now cause the new tech sucks. Good job bean counters. The last story is, you don't need help? Okay, just make sure you roll out of the way of the go-karts. This is a relatively short story from the time I worked at a go-kart track for a summer 
to earn some extra cash. Me and my friends all decided to work there, but didn't realize how crazy it was going to be. Every single day there was a massive issue when someone was either fired or chewed out by the owner. Let's call him Greg. Now it's important to note for this story that Greg wasn't in the best shape. He was larger than life so to speak, but despite this he would be trying to help every day on the track. More likely than not causing problems that would have been easily avoided. The micromanaging was brutal, and when he wasn't physically there he would send us a lengthy email at the end of the day, telling us what he did wrong after watching the cameras on the track. Now Greg also had an attitude of he can do no wrong, and also he doesn't need help from nobody, which led to some awkward situations with customers, especially when they were upset. More likely than not, myself or the other employees had to apologize to customers daily when he would raise their voices at them for not wearing their helmet correctly, and if we ever mentioned it, he would then turn on us and begin to chew us out for doubting his actions. So one of our responsibilities is standing around the track with a stop sign with the word slow on it to wave at drivers who were going too fast and driving recklessly. The vehicles were too loud to simply yell at them. The track was pretty bendy, but part of it zoomed right by Greg's office where he always kept a sign handy in case he thought a driver needed to slow way down. It was one of those days and a driver was zooming and bumping against other drivers in the walls, so Greg thunders out of the office, grabs his sign and waved it in front of the driver in question, who proceeds to whiz right past him. He goes around again. Greg more aggressively shakes the sign at the driver, who once again ignored him and kept going. This did not please Greg. Finally, Greg uses all his might and really shakes the sign in front of the driver's face, but unfortunately loses his balance and falls onto the track, we rush over to him and ask if he needs help, which he replies with, in his usual angry bellow, I'm fine, leave me. Now normally for any other person we could have stopped the traffic and given him a hand regardless, but this was Greg, and he was very clear that he was fine and we should leave him. But despite that, he was still on the ground, rolling around and unsuccessfully getting upright from his prone position. I suddenly get an amazing idea. I grab some spare orange traffic cones and put them around him on the track to make sure that the carts didn't get too close. It was all I really could do while following his instructions. Only about 10 minutes later when all the go-karts had pulled off the track was when Greg managed to get himself upright, but by then we had already all busted a gut laughing. I'll truly never forget seeing him squirming mere inches from carts while refusing help. It was a sight to see. Edit. I was working at the time, so unfortunately I couldn't record any video evidence, but I do have an email he sent me when he was angry, and possibly drunk, about an error we made during the day, where the font increases every line or so. Thank you for watching, hit the like button to support the channel and subscribe. Have a good day!